Thessalonians 5. We're going to look at verse 16 through 18. Uh, in fact, also verse 19. First, first Thessalonians 5, verse 16 to 19. As we study the Korean revival, this isn't going to be an address that is particularly expositional, but there is a uh, few revivals throughout history that would best uh, uh, that would would best fit this this scriptural passage that we're about to read from First Thessalonians than the Korean revival. It uh, it uh, just perfectly by the grace of God lived out these realities and saw them uh, uh, come with fruition throughout the nation. So in First Thessalonians chapter five and verse sixteen, Paul says, "Rejoice always, pray without ceasing." That'll be one of the key texts. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. North Korea at the moment, uh, whose capital is Pyongyang, is uh, has been sitting for the last 20 years or so at the very top of the uh, watch list for Open Doors, which is a, a persecuted Christians ministry. Uh, it's been sitting at the top of the list or near the top of the list for the, the most difficult countries to live in as a Christian. Um, and it has not always been that way. Uh, in fact, the current setup between North and South Korea, as we know it today, is only a very recent invention uh, in the uh, history of Korea, that kingdom and empire. Uh, it, it has been that way in the North and South since 1945. So after the Second World War, the, the Japanese were defeated and they were um, they had invaded Korea and were um, occupying it, but they had been thrown out then after their loss in the uh, Second World War. And the Russian communists took control of the north half of Korea and the Western Americans took control of the uh, bottom half and made it a republic, a democratic republic. And the north under the communists became a Stalinist styled communistic um, uh, dictatorship. And uh, so right to this day, South Korea is a free, thriving society, giving us uh, blessed goods such as the Samsung TV, uh, the Hyundai. Um, there's probably one or two cell phones that they've produced as well. Um, uh, and uh, experts say that South Korea is, is probably one of the most Christianized nations in the world. That they think that it's more Christianized, more thoroughly and genuinely Christianized than even North America and England. Um, uh, however, North Korea is currently a Stalinist communist nation, uh, one of the, really the last one in the world that is still functioning in that capacity. It, uh, religion is outlawed. Uh, millions have died due to government mismanagement of uh, food and resources. It is, it is one of the places that is quite accurate to say, unless you are the top 0.5 of a percent. It is hell on earth in North Korea. But it is also, North Korea is uh, just uh, 150 years ago, is home to one of the, 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 the planet's greatest revivals that ever occurred. Um, so if you track back with me through history to 1866, in 1866, the uh, Korea was not North and South as we know it now, it was just a single kingdom. Um, uh, and there was a man by the name of Robert Germain Thomas. Now, some of you have heard, uh, I believe it was Pastor Craig when he was here back in March, or in fact, I think it was, I think it was February, 2020. He, he used Robert Germain Thomas as a, a part of his um, uh, sermon illustration, but Robert Germain Thomas was a Welshman. He was a Protestant and he went to uh, China in order to be a missionary with his wife. His wife died uh, just after about four months of being there as she had a, a horrible miscarriage with their child. And so his, his uh, uh, unborn child and wife died, which terribly affected him. Uh, he was unsure whether God was calling into missions or not, but he stayed in China to await God's clarity. And in time, he became a uh, uh, impassioned with the idea of taking the gospel to the Korean people. It was a closed kingdom. They didn't want any outside Western influence, especially from Christianity. And so whatever happened was going to be a, a very covert mission. And so he found uh, a way to get in with the Americans. He himself was Welsh and he was working in a customs office in China, but he found a way to uh, uh, learn Korean 
and become an interpreter for the American traders that were going into Korea. And so in 1866, Robert Germain Thomas was aboard the, the General Sherman, which was a vessel, an American vessel going into Korea to try and make a um, uh, uh, trade to try and open up some kind of trade between America and Korea because they were totally closed off to anything like that. Now, um, <coughs> uh, to be honest, Robert Germain's Thomas uh, effort was entirely just to be on that boat so that he could get Chinese Bibles into the Korean country. But that was the only reason he was really there. Um, the whole interpreter thing was pretty much just to cover for him. But he was there. And um, uh, and he had he had literally tons of Chinese Bibles on the boat in the vessel as they were going into these uncharted, uh, uh, unwelcoming, uh, uh, tricky waters into Korea, going up the uh, the river that would lead them to the capital. And as they were going, um, uh, Robert Germain Thomas would he was distributing as many of the Bibles as he could at every port that they. They, they stopped into. And so he had so many Koreans coming on board to hear his, this Westerner preach to them in, in, in almost perfect fluent Korean. They were receiving Chinese Bibles, which they were mostly able to read. And uh, at one point, it actually says that he had so many Koreans on the boat listening to him preach that the boat almost capsized. So he had, he had a large audience. God was really blessing his missionary work. And he was handing out Bibles all the way that he was going. Um, but tensions were rising between the Korean officials and the, the Sherman, the boat that they were on, because the Americans were not welcome in Korea and they were not doing their best to try and uh, <laughs> uh, keep tensions at bay. They were being quite arrogant, quite rude to the Korean um, uh, principles, um, especially as they were coming closer to the capital of Korea, which was Pyongyang. Um, a lot of tensions were rising to the point that when the Sherman came into uh, uh, the capital city of Pyongyang on the river, uh, there was failed communication and the Americans started making threats against the, the Koreans and actually started firing their cannonballs at the, the civilians on the shore, much against Robert Germain Thomas's pleas. He was trying to keep it peaceful, but they weren't listening to him. Um, and, and so that then the Sherman, not knowing the Korean waters it was in, actually run aground on a mud bank. And the Koreans very cleverly lit small boats on fire and sent them down the river. And so they ran into the, 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 the General Sherman vessel and it started to explode in flames. So that Robert Germain Thomas, this missionary, who was only 27 years old, started throwing as many Bibles overboard as he could and uh, landing some of them on the embankment. And he himself jumped into the water and swam to the uh, shore with three Bibles. And uh, um, he was uh, taken, he was arrested on the, on, as soon as he got to the, 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 the shore, a man by the name of Chun Kwon Park. If there's any Koreans in our midst tonight, they'll tell you I'm, I'm mispronouncing it, but that's okay. Chun Kwon Park was a Korean official who arrested Robert Germain Thomas and brought him uh, to the general, um, to the governor of the on the river shore. And uh, as he was about to be killed and he knew his, his time was up, he, he pleaded with the, the man to take the Bible. He, he gave the man a Bible as the sword came down and chopped off his head. And Korea drank the, the blood of the very first martyr there in the capital city of Pyongyang. He died at just 27 years of age. The Korean authority, however, um, uh, they did whatever they could to strip everybody. And anybody who had gotten one of these Chinese Bibles, they were taking the Bibles off of them. They were burning them. They were throwing them away. Um, but there were some some people, including a young child, who was able to keep some Bibles and hide them and keep them for themselves in the future years. So that's 1866, the first Protestant uh, uh, martyr in Korea, in Pyongyang, in 1866. Fast forward 30 years, about. In the 1890s, now you've got an American missionary trying to get into Korea, and it's a lot more open now because trades are opening up. 30 years is a lot of progress. So now you've got Reverend Moffat. Reverend Moffat is an American missionary. He's gone to Korea and in his travels around the Pyongyang mountains and rivers, as he's trying to share Christ and not get himself killed, he, uh, he comes across a man who is about in his 40s, who actually knew the story of Jesus, 
and knew the knew much of the gospel content. He wasn't a Christian yet, but he he knew about Jesus. He knew about the Bible. He knew about the Apostle Paul. It was it was a very strange situation for this American missionary to find in this hut uh, on the riverbank, and so um, he he found him and and this young man. His name was uh, Cho Chi Rang, and he actually told Moffat that uh, he had quite an interesting story, because when he was just eleven years old, thirty years beforehand. He and his uncle had gone down to the Taedong River in Pyongyang because they had heard that an American ship was coming in through the river. And so he and his uncle went down and they watched as this fight broke out and a Westerner uh, 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 swam to shore throwing Bibles and was executed. This young man, Cho, uh, let me get it right, Cho, Cho Chi Ring had witnessed the death of Robert Germain Thomas and had that day been one of the men that had kept a Bible for himself. And he, he took back the Bible to his own house and since then had been studying it. And at that moment, Reverend Moffat was able to bring this man, Cho Chi Ring, to faith because he had already been so prepared by the reading of the scriptures over so long. Um, and, and, uh, and so this young man got the Bible and then was saved 30 years later in 1890 at the hands of, uh, of Reverend Moffat. Um, <clears throat> there, was a, there was another man back in 1866 who had also kept a Bible, but this man was a Korean official. He was a Korean official who had overseen many of the killings of the Westerners. And he himself also kept a Bible, not because he cared about the content, but because he really liked the nice flaky golden lined uh, pages of the Bible. And so he ripped it all up very carefully, sliced all the pages out. And he actually uh, wallpapered his, his hut, his government built hut in Bible pages uh, because he thought it looked nice, beautiful Chinese characters. He just liked the, the specialty of it. Um, but over the years, many people, many Koreans had started to come into that hut to read this, this mystical, wonderful, um, uh, foreign story that they could find on this man's walls. And so hundreds of Koreans had been prepared for the message of Jesus over this 30 year period, because in the governor's house, there was Bible plastered to the walls. Um, and it was in fact, uh, Cho Chi Ring, who as he's talking that day in 1890, he's talking with Reverend Moffat and he tells him that day, uh, newly converted, like just converted in that moment. And he tells him, uh, I saved up money and I purchased the hut that that uh, uh, that Pak Yong Sik, the 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 Korean official, had plastered with the ha with the Bible, and I purchased it, and I've recently moved into it. In fact, that is the building that we are sitting in right now. And Reverend uh, Reverend uh, Moffat looked around with his little lantern, and he realized that thirty years um, uh, old Bible passages have just been plastered to the house that he is in. It's an amazing story of God's magnificent uh, providence. When he wants the Bible and the story of the gospel to get into a people, he is able to do it no matter the opposition. It is one of the most inspiring stories that at the moment, Robert Germain Thomas has never heard, but he will hear in the days of glory when we can recount it to him. Uh, so so in, the, in the point of 1887, there was seven Korean Protestant converts. In 1887, there was seven Korean Protestant converts. There was a lot of Catholics, but they don't count. They need the gospel too. It was seven Korean converts. And then that takes us about 20 years later to 1903. In 1903, Korea started seeing its first signs of a God-given revival. Um, at this point in 1903, uh, the Koreans had only had the New Testament in their language for three years. It was completed in 1900. So having had the, the New Testament in their language for three years, um, they wouldn't even have the Old Testament until 19, uh, 1911, which is four years after the, the, the revival really kicks off. So God does all of this, even though they don't have an Old Testament. He re God really starts breaking our rules of what would be a nice and tidy revival um, uh, in what he does in Korea. But the first signs of revival started in 1903 because there was another missionary, another American. His name was Dr. Hardy, and he had experienced a pretty fruitless mission venture. He had not seen anybody convincingly converted. 
He was actually beginning to be very depressed. And he was asked by some of the other missionaries to come to the mission um, headquarters and uh, uh, give a, a, a series of teaching on prayer and holiness. And so he starts working on these lessons that he's going to be bringing. And in 1903, as he's preparing on them, he feels God begin to just break his own heart around his lack of prayer and lack of holiness. And so he's preparing to teach others, but he himself is being uh, destroyed by the lessons that he's gleaning from scripture. And um, he realized especially that his arrogance as being a Westerner, as opposed to these unlearned Koreans, his arrogance was a part of what was hindering the gospel spread. So he was very repentant to, about that to the Lord, but uh, he in fact opened up quite publicly about that as he was preaching and as he was teaching the missionaries and the other Koreans that were with them. Uh, he opened up and um, it had such a tremendous effect on the missionaries in Pyongyang in the capital. It's such a tremendous effect that the mission centers from all over the nation, and there was many at this point, started requesting that he would go there and go on a bit of a traveling speaking crusade and teach what he had taught at each of them. And what was amazing was that everywhere that he went and delivered his devotions, there was public confession of sin. There was immediate and radical repentance, people changing what they were doing wrong. Um, and, uh, and this was among the missionaries and the Christians. This hasn't quite got yet out into the unconverted yet. It's mostly just among the church. And so uh, fast forward a year, 1904, um, uh, there was at this point in that year, after 1903, when, when they all get pure and they all get holy and they all start praying more, in 1904, they see 10,000 converts to the Christian faith. 10,000 converts in Korea uh, was, their, was their number. Uh, th then there was even more in, in um, 1905. And in 1906, there was 30,000 converts. Now, what this, what this tells us is while we're celebrating all of that, we still have to bear with the, the ugly reality that Korean Christians are immature. Uh, not because they're Korean. Uh, uh, not because of any other reason than the fact that they are very young in the faith. You've got 30,000 people. So the church is just blown by about 2,000 fold. And they have, um, uh, uh, they don't even have the Old Testament yet. They, they can't read Genesis. All they have is New Testament. It's only been in their language for three years. There'll be so much missing in terms of depth of understanding in the Korean church. And so it's quite, I don't want to say shallow, but you get the idea of what I mean. It's not, it doesn't have the depth uh, uh, that we would want it to have. Um, and so those 30,000 people, uh, uh, even the missionaries there would say 30,000 baptisms does not always mean 30,000 genuine believers, but we're believing and praying that God would take this further and deeper. But it was in 1904 that the, the revival started in Wales. Now, in Wales, where Robert Germain Thomas was from, there's an interesting connection between Korea and Wales. Uh, but the revival in Wales of 1904, which will be our subject of study next term, the 1904 Welsh revival, the news of that came to the American missionaries um, and also came to some of the missionaries in India. And when they heard of it, they were stirred to pray. So there was Welsh missionaries in India. They heard about the Welsh revival and uh, it, it stirred their expectancy as it always should when we hear about revival. And they prayed for revival and they saw revival in India and it just swept through the, uh, through the, through the uh, colonies they were in. The news of that and the Welsh revival spread to Korea and the Korean Christians started feeling that they were missing out. And they said, God doesn't love Indians more than he loves Koreans. God doesn't love the Welsh more than he loves the Koreans. Let's pray that he would do the same here. It's the same saving gospel. It's the same gracious God. So they began to pray and uh, 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 they, they had daily prayer meetings among the missionaries nationwide, especially in Pyongyang. They had daily prayer meetings that went from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. And if they wanted to, they could just skip out on dinner and go all the way through to 8 p.m. So four to eight hour prayer meetings every day. And they were expecting that God would pour out his spirit through conversion of souls and a purification of the church. Um, and they did that for, for, for a long while. They didn't stop. And then, by, uh, then it got to 1906. They were still meeting regularly and praying. And in 1906, another missionary, okay, another missionary by the name of Mr. Swollen, 
um, and uh, his colleague, William Blair, they visited one of the missionary stations and they held a prayer meeting and a teaching service from the Bible, much as they had done before, nothing unusual. But after they had finished, the missionaries and many of the Korean evangelists and pastors just start getting up one by one and confessing their sins, weeping uncontrollably, sitting down. Now, the missionaries are weeded out because in their own words, they are Protestant Europeans and Americans. They come from churches where signs of emotion are not seen. <laughs> so they're like Presbyterian to the core. You don't show emotion in church. You just go through the liturgy, praise the Lord and go home. But they're seeing these, these people just get up and weep and confess their sins and make amends with one another and sit on down and continue to pray. And, and they're very weeded out by it. Um, they announced a hymn. It says in one of the accounts, it says they announced a hymn so that by singing, they could all get their emotions back in order. <laughs> they expected that singing a hymn would just calm everybody down, stop the Pentecostal, Pentecostal nonsense and get us back to uh, good Presbyterian liturgy. Right. But it didn't work. People were still still convulsing with their tears and their confessions and their prayers. And they could tell that this was clearly an outpouring of heaven. It was not disorderly. It was just overwhelming. So the next morning, they hurried home and they shared with their other missionaries what had been going on at the prayer meeting. And uh, everybody simply concluded that we have to pray that God would continue the work that he has just started. This is obviously God pouring out his spirit. We need to pray that it would continue so that many Koreans can be saved. Um, and so now we're in January of 1907. January of 1907, and if you if you know the Korean revival, it is known as the 1907 revival. So this is the big year. And in this year, uh, there was in January a week-long men's prayer meeting. And they had 960 men registered for the conference. And they were all longing to spend the time studying God's word, praying together. And many of the missionaries were expecting that God would use this time in the capital to pour out a spirit of revival to see mass conversions but it got you know all the way through the pre through the meet the week-long meeting and nothing extraordinary had happened there was bible study there was hymns there was fellowship but nothing extraordinary and the missionaries couldn't help but feel a sense of jealousy over the revivals that had happened elsewhere there's a holy jealousy for god's glory in his name uh but on the uh, uh final night of the week there was unregistered people who came and so they had about 1600 to 2000 people at the meeting and uh, uh brother keel who was a presbyterian pastor he got up in front of everybody un unwelcomed he just stood up and confessed openly that it was his own sin that was holding back the church from seeing god's blessing in revival Everybody was, was paused with bated breath. Can you imagine a pastor getting up and saying that in a meeting of 2,000 people? He said, about a year ago, a friend of mine was dying and he called me to his home and said to me, blessed elder, I'm about to pass away. I want you to manage my affairs because my wife is unable. I said, rest your heart. I will do it. And I did manage that man's estate for his widow, but I managed to put $100 of her money into my own pocket. I have hindered God. I am going to give that $100 back to the widow by tomorrow morning. Now, just imagine what $100 would be back in 1907. This is a, a large sum of money that a pastor had stolen from a dying man and his widow. But the accounts tell us that after Brother Keel had confessed that way, Jonathan Goforth, who was a missionary to China and India and Manchuria and also went to Korea, he says, the effect was instant. It was like the breaking forth of a dam. The Holy Spirit moved amongst the people. Conviction of sin swept the audience. And so again, these, these Western missionaries start seeing what they were not used to, but what they had been praying for, which was the Holy Spirit sweep through these people um, in what they say very honestly was a very uncomfortable, very strange, extraordinary way. 
They say man after man would arise, confess his sins, break down and weep, and then throw himself to the floor and beat the floor with his fist in perfect agony of conviction. Sometimes, it says, after a confession, the whole audience would break out in audible prayer. The effect of that on, of, on that audience of hundreds of men praying together in audible prayer was something indescribable. Again, after another confession, they would break out in uncontrollable weeping, and we would weep with them. We could not help it. And so the meeting went on until two o'clock in the morning with confession and weeping and prayer. That's what one missionary, Graham Lee, says. William Blair, who was the guy preaching that night, just as a preacher, this, this, is, this is like your dream and the biggest fear. You have no, no clue what to do when God does that after you've been preaching. If you watch that and William Blair has seen it and it all starts happening, William Blair says that the effect was indescribable. But we should note, he says, it was not an effect of confusion. It was not chaos. It was not a bunch of people writhing on the ground, being silly, yelling over the top of one another. The crowd would go quiet. Another man would get up and confess his sin and would sit down and weep as everybody prays in harmony for the man. It was the most amazing display, he says, of the mingling of souls moved by an irresistible impulse of prayer. The prayer sounded to me like the falling of many waters, an ocean of prayer beating against God's throne. The meeting, which was scheduled to end that night, actually kept on going for many nights afterwards as people kept on coming back, hearing the gospel and confessing and weeping over God's grace and their sin. Um, it, it, we need to remind ourselves it was not mere show. It wasn't just people getting up and, and outdoing each other with the most amazing testimonies of sin in their life. These were mostly professing Christians getting up and telling people the, the unconfessed sin that remained in their heart and God blessing the people with a, uh, a wave of the Holy Spirit's blessings in response. Um, and, and the confessions had both immediate retribution and a sense of forgiveness through the gospel. So, so uh, in other words, people would get up and they would confess and they would, they would say, I'm going to go and make this right, right now. And people would um, even leave the meetings. And before the next mornings, uh, we have um, uh, uh, examples of uh, one of the Koreans had cheated the missionaries out of a lot of money. He confessed it. He went home, got the money and brought it to the, the missionaries straight away. We have a, a servant of a doctor who had been cheating him out of money under his nose. One of the Western doctors was being stolen from him. He confessed it. He, weep, he wept and he immediately gave back everything that he could. We also have a, the, the incidents of a man who got up and confessed that he had moved across the country away from his wife and child and, and had been living with another woman in an adulterous relationship and had children. He saw to it before the night was out that she would receive plentiful support and church support. And he moved back across the nation that very week to go and be with his family again. We have uh, uh, the evidence of a woman who stood up and confessed that she had been in an adulterous relationship. And the missionaries were very afraid of what would happen next because in Korean law, a husband has the right to execute his wife if that is confessed. And the husband walked up onto the stage, stood next to his wife, knelt down with her and prayed for the forgiveness of God over them both for their sins. It was some of the most amazing evident use, evident, evident work of God. But the best confession that came was an old man, a very old man who walked slowly up onto the stage, overcome with his guilt. His name was Cho Chu Won Park. He went up to the front and he confessed that it was in fact him who with his sword had killed the well-known missionary, Robert Germain Thomas, 41 years previously. By this point in Korea, Robert Germain Thomas is a household name. It's like Steve Owen in Australia. Everybody knows Robert Germain Thomas as one of the heroes who brought Christianity to Korea. And now in the middle of this prayer meeting, this man hops up and confesses that though he's been a Christian for a while and has been in the, the house church that is built uh, that, it, that is inside the, the house that is plastered with the, with the Bible pages. He's in that house church, and yet he has always kept secret that he had murdered God's first martyr in Korea. He confesses it, and the effects on the, um, on the, the, the congregation, the impact of his testimony was profound. 
This old man's son would in future years become one of the elders of the Presbyterian church in Korea. So God was doing amazing things. Next, missionaries started to call a meeting. Uh, the missionaries got home and they put their heads together and said, this is weird. We're not used to this in our Presbyterian circles and our Methodist circles and our, in our congregational circles. Um, and they consulted what to do about it uh, because they were concerned that it would just turn into a frenzy. It would turn crazy. And so uh, they, they, however, they, they decided amongst themselves that they would not interfere because it had seemed so evidently because of the gospel being preached, people honestly confessing and making good of their repentance. And because of the sense of forgiveness through the gospel, this was evidently a true revival. So they let it continue. One account says, as the prayer meetings ended, people went home right across the nation, but the Holy Spirit went with them. Christians returned to their homes in the country, taking the Pentecostal fire with them. Everywhere the story was told, the same spirit flamed forth and spread till practically every church, not only in North Korea, but throughout the entire peninsula, had received its share of the revival blessing. Even the schools had to lay aside lessons for days while the children wept over their wrongdoings together. So this is a revival of mass prayer, mass conversion, and mass location. However, it was also met with thousands of revival, of, of, of um, conversions. It says that by the middle of 1907, there was 30,000 new converts. In just six months, they have gotten the, the same amount of converts that they had ever gotten in the biggest year before of 1906. 30,000 new converts were connected to the Pyong, Pyong, Pyongyang churches alone. There was one conversion, which was a notorious gang leader. He had been a, uh, a, a Korean gang leader. And on his conversion, he went, he just walked into one of the, the prayer meetings and he heard the gospel and he confessed all of this sin. In fact, he rode to a, uh, a, to the judge's courthouse and he confessed all of his crimes. And they said, we'd love to throw you in prison, but in Korean law, you need an accuser. And since none of these crimes are, are accounted for, and there is no accuser, you only accuse yourself, go free. We can't punish you. And so he was allowed to go free by the grace of God. Uh, another notorious conversion was somebody in the Japanese military. He was very high up and he um, had uh, been an official for quite a while. And he, he wandered into the, one of the prayer meetings just to see what was going on, to bully a few people, to send the crowd home. And when he saw the people praying, the people confessing sins and the gospel being preached, he was converted and he also confessed his sins and was added to the church. Thousands and thousands of others can be told. Many of them are just lost to history, but God knows them. Uh, and, and, and no doubt this, this uh, was an amazing revival of conversions. This rate of revival of souls being converted continued on until 1910 and even beyond that. Uh, it, there was this amazing uh, uh, account where somebody's interviewing Dr. Underwood, who was one of the first missionaries back with Dr. Moffat back in the 1890s. And back then, he said, uh, 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 he'd been there that whole time, and somebody's talking to this elderly man, this, this uh, uh, missionary, and says, um, you know, what, what do you make of everything that's going on? And he just says, 24 years ago, there was one Protestant Christian in Korea. Now, there is well over 200,000. That was all he could say. What an amazing work of God that swept this peninsula of the nation that we now call Korea. One thing that is uh, needed to, to uh, uh, remember, and again, we'll go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 and onwards, um, uh, as we realize one of the, the, the very tricky things that has been plaguing this revival ever since the beginning, which we have not yet um, addressed. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16 tells us, rejoice always. They've been doing that. Pray without ceasing. That has been their key marker. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God, uh, uh, the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Well, I have not been quenching the spirit, but that command there of Paul to give thanks in all circumstances seems pretty easy to obey when you think of the Korean revival. But in fact, that whole period that we've been talking about in the background, it was not all, all flowers and daisies. 
In fact, the background socio-political climate was that uh, Korea was under the occupation of Japan. And Japan had been increasing their brutality and their tyranny over all of Korea and especially the Korean Christians. So as the revival was spreading, they were in the circumstances that would not seem all that uh, beneficial to Christians and the, the gospel spread. In fact, the J Japanese had increased their, their statism, their absolute authority of the government, uh, and they had begun to force Shintoism one of the, the Japanese um, traditional religions, onto the Koreans. The Korean church allowed it at first because they believed under the Japanese lies, they believed that it was just political, bowing down to the idols and it was not religious. But eventually they, they put their foot down and said, no, this is too much. We've learned our lesson. This is idolatry. And they stood against it much to their own persecution and suffering. They were, they were rejoicing, the missionaries say. The Koreans were rejoicing that they were deemed worthy of suffering for the Lord. This revival had amazing, long-lasting effects. Today, Korea is probably the most Christianized country in the world. That is an enormous statement because they got the gospel not, you know, about 150 years ago at the at the most. This was an amazing thing to happen. Seoul is claimed to contain, in, in modern day, Seoul claims to contain 11 out of the 12 largest Christian congregations of the world. So of the top 12 Christian largest Christian congregations in the whole world, 11 of them are in Seoul, the capital of South Korea. With the exception of America, South Korea sends out more Christian missionaries today than in any other country of the world. I'm going to say that again because that's crazy. South Korea sends out more missionaries than any other nation in any part of the world except for America. And I would bet that the better quality missionaries are coming from South Korea. Uh, however, in the north of Korea, they remain to be at the, the top spot or near the top spot on open doors, uh, 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 most difficult places for a Christian to live. The estimates are put at about 400,000 Christians living in North Korea, uh, whose population is about 25 million. Uh, however, 70,000 of them, somewhere up to 100,000, are living in labor camps and in prisons because uh, the church in North Korea is uh, highly persecuted. If you're known to be a Christian, you're on the bottom rung of society. Uh, at the moment, they are, they are facing terrible struggles of, of famine and starvation because of the COVID-19 pandemic and they closed borders and um, the failure of the leadership there. And Christians get the food last. That's the rule. Many Christians are in labor camps and prison camps. Uh, and yet the North Korean church is growing. It is still growing. There's lessons as we sort of close out here and you guys start to you know, break off into your own times of prayer. The, uh, there's lessons to learn from the Korean uh, revival of 1907 and following. One of the clear lessons, of course, is as Paul says in um, uh, 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 in First Thessalonians five, he says, "Pray without ceasing." In in verse fifteen, we we see him say, "See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone." That also was perfectly lived out among the Korean revival as everybody sought to undo their, their, their thievery and their sins and their crimes against one another. Um, but especially there in verse 17, pray without ceasing. There is an extraordinary power in prayer because it is the power of God being unleashed through the believing church. We often desire something more exciting than just prayer. Obviously, this is uh, often this is the case in individual lives. We fail to pray because we think of prayer so lowly. But even uh, in our families, even more so in our churches, and definitely across the nation and the Western world, uh, we want something more exciting than prayer. We believe that something more, more extraordinary than prayer will do the work because simply bowing down, bringing our concerns, our desires, and prayers to God that he would bring the kingdom is just not enough. There's got to be something more to do. And yet the Korean revival reminds us of just how extraordinarily powerful prayer is when it is made in faith to the King of Kings. It is vital to 
any work of God. Charles Spurgeon used to say that we will see no increase or no uh, increase of the kingdom of God in general in our nation until the prayer meetings of churches are better attended. I think that still stands very true today. We might have uh, uh, very popular um, uh, conferences where people will flock to uh, hear good preaching, but very few will make time to go and just pray together. And yet it is something that we have to see happen. The second lesson that we can learn from the Koreans and what God did there uh, is the Spirit's pattern of contrition. That when the Holy Spirit falls on a people, just as in Pentecost, they, they cry out, cut to the heart. When the Holy Spirit comes to revive a church of believers, and when it comes to the world through conversions, what Jesus said rings true. The Holy Spirit will convict the world according to sin and righteousness and judgment. But he also comes, as we're told in First Peter, that judgment starts at the household of God. Wherever the Spirit comes, he brings a contrition over sin, which doesn't always look like everybody confessing everything publicly. That, that, was, that, that was maybe something quite unique. It doesn't need to be forced. But true contrition, whether it's publicly confessed or whether sin is just confessed to the offended parties, true contrition always involves a confession to God and a true repentance away from that sin. That's something that we saw in Korea so powerfully and something that we have to uh, expect the uncomfortable reality of true contrition if we are praying for revival. Thirdly, we can learn the lesson of how God works. And this is as we think more historically, more, more cosmically, more, more, more long-term. You can see as you learn the lesson or see the history of Korea and the revival in Korea, you can see how God works revival into the overarching plan of his providence. Uh, it, it's amazing to me that just 30 years before the country becomes, North Korea becomes one of the most closed off nations in the whole world, 30 years before North Korea becomes entirely closed off to external trade and influence, just 30 years before that, God centers one of the most powerful revivals ever in the world right in their capital city. So that even now, many Christians have fled from North Korea, and even now North Korea is biting down hard onto Christianity, and yet that is because while it's outlawed completely, the Christians in North Korea are the termites in the satanic empire of King John un and his emperor, empire. The Christians are there. They are underground. They have been spread since between 1907 and 1945 and beyond. They, they got deeply rooted in every part of society and right across the nation. It is almost impossible to send missionaries into North Korea. But at the moment, it's not really necessary. Because before God let it be closed down, he sent revival so that the Christians are there. They're widespread. They just need freedom to preach the gospel. And even without it, the gospel is growing. So we can just see the amazing workings of God that before Satan rose up his political beasts to assault the church, he had already set thousands, hundreds of thousands of Christians alight in that nation. And then lastly, a reminder that God does not respect people groups. Uh, he sent a revival to Wales. He sent it to India. He had in recent years sent one to America. We've learned about the one that happened in Scotland uh, in the 1800s. And then he blew his, his reviving spirit onto Korea. We need to remember, and I dare you to believe, I dare you to believe and pray like you believe it, that God can, will, and must do a similar work in Australia and that nothing is stopping him simply because, well, we know how Australians are, or, or that's a Korean thing that happens, or, or that's the sort of thing that happens in Europe because that's very particular. We've never seen a revival on any scale notable in Australia. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on the record as saying that. There's been little bits here and there, little blips, but we've never seen something so widespread and powerful. I dare you to believe that it may happen because God doesn't care about people groups. He's willing to bless uh, a hungry and a thirsty faith-filled church who will just pray that God sends his reviving work among us.